Good evening, and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Junior Forum at the Institute of Politics. My name is Annabelle Krauss, and I'm a junior studying history and literature and classical civilizations at the college, and I'm a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee. Before we begin, please note the exit doors, which are located on both the park side and the JFK Street side of the forum. In the event of an emergency, walk to the exit closest to you and congregate in JFK Park. Please also take a moment now to silence your cell phones and join me in welcoming Harvard undergraduate Javier Serra. Hello everyone and welcome to the JFK Junior Forum at the Institute of Politics. My name is Javier Serra and I'm a sophomore at the college as well as a member of the JFK Junior Forum Committee. Today we have the pleasure of hearing from former Speaker of the United States House of Representatives Paul Ryan. Speaker Ryan served in the House of Representatives from 1999 to 2019, serving most recently as Speaker of the House from 2015 to 2019. Prior to becoming Speaker, then Congressman Ryan chaired the House Budget Committee from 2011 to 2015 and was the Republican Party's Vice Presidential nominee in the 2012 election. Speaker Ryan played a key role in passing the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act of 2016 and the Economic Growth, Regulatory Relief, and Consumer Protection Act in 2018. Today's conversation is about the current state of the economy, inflation, and tax policy. Moderating this discussion will be Karen Dynan, the professor of the practice of public policy and the professor of the practice of economics. She's also a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute of Economics. She's also a senior, uh, she's also the chair of the American Economic Association Committee on Economic Statistics. She previously served as Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy and Chief Economist at the U.S. Department of Treasury from 2014 to 2017. Professor Dynan has also worked on the staff of the Federal Reserve Board and is a senior economist at the White House Council of Economic Advisors. Please join me in welcoming Speaker Ryan and Professor Dynan to the stage. Evening. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, so we're. There he is. Okay, I was, he's over here, Kevin. I was looking for you. I, my son's here. Sorry, I was looking for him. Sorry, I didn't mean to. Did I just embarrass you, Charlie? <laughs> a little bit, sorry. Um, so we advertised this as a talk about the economy, but um, given what's going on in Washington, D.C. right now, I think we need to. What do you mean? <laughs> Some stuff. I think we need to talk about what's going on in the House of Representatives. So, um, uh, they're uh, in the process of trying to determine who the next speaker is going to be. Um, a majority is needed. The Republicans only have a slim majority in the House, so there needs to be near unanimity right. to get uh, a speaker. So. Um, I think they were going to do a vote right now, but they put yeah, it off till tomorrow morning. Yeah, they it till tomorrow, I think. I just got a text on that. So it was going to be at 6, like right now, but uh, there was a member of Gus Bill Rockus out of town. He's back now, but they don't have the votes. So they're going to postpone it till tomorrow, which means Jim will have another 12 hours to work on people. Yeah, well, so um, if you were in the House right now, what would you try, be trying to get your colleagues to do? Well, what Jim will try to do is work there's 20 people that voted against him and he'll try and work that list down he, he has, he's got to get 17 of those people to vote for him the challenge in this particular i looked at the list it's not just one group typically if it's a group against you you can you can get the leader of that group have a conversation flip the group this is whipping 101 and then get them to go but this was five new yorkers then sort of a random assortment of members who i would call sort of institutionalists more senior members from appropriations and authorizing committees. And so it's, 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 a, harder, it's a harder hill to climb. Uh, I think he can do it, uh, but he's got to flip 17 people tonight. Yeah. And, and you know, Kevin went 15 rounds with about the same number of people. Uh, this is a bit different. And I think it's possible that Jim can get over the hump, but, um, but, but it's, it's, it's new for him to have to do this. This is not, Jim wasn't in leadership. He's never whipped before. So, you know, he's going to have to just work on, on these 20 people and try and get them to change their mind. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So tell me. So um, 
you know, based on your experience as Speaker of the House, uh, what 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 advice would you offer to the next speaker, whoever that turns yeah. out to be? My benefit was it was sort of similar. The, the, this same group that went after Kevin McCarthy with the motion to vacate, a similar group, not the exact same group, a similar group, a guy named Mark Meadows, who I know you know Mark, um, he was going to offer a motion to vacate on John Boehner. John Boehner, in anticipation of that, just resigned. The next guy in line was this, the majority leader, Kevin McCarthy. I was chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, exactly where I wanted to be in Congress. Kevin McCarthy was up. He ran for it, didn't have the votes, and the thing sort of spelled into chaos. And then I got recruited to run for it because I was the consensus person that everybody would vote for. So I didn't have to go around really asking for votes. I didn't have to campaign for it. I didn't have to go and whip people. Or I just answered lots of questions at forums, but, but, but I was able to get the vote that way. So it was, I was able to do it on my terms. And I set the term. My son here is here. I, I wanted to be home on weekends because I had a young family, not traveling around raising money. So I had a few conditions I set. Plus, I wanted us to, to stand up an agenda and run on it. So I had a few conditions. I laid those out in the conference. Everybody thought those were acceptable. And then I was elected. That's not exactly how this thing's going down right now. <laughs> um, Kevin yeah. got vacated by Gates and seven other nihilists who were just burning the place down. Yeah. No reason for it, really. Uh, and then now they just can't get, it, they have a four vote margin. Yeah. So they just can't get consensus on anybody. Steve Scalise was the next guy in line. Um, he pulled it from going to the floor because he realized he knows how to whip. He's very, he was my whip. Uh, he knows how to whip and he knew he didn't have it. And he didn't want to put the country through a torturous 15 round voting like Kevin had done. So he pulled out. Jim's the next guy in the queue. He's trying it right now. And we'll know tomorrow. I don't think he'll go 15 rounds. I think if he goes in the second round and that vote count goes up, yeah. he's done. If, he goes, if the vote count goes down, meaning the no's shrink, maybe one or two more rounds. But if, but if that vote count doesn't really move very quickly, then you could give a shot to another person to try for it, like a Tom Emmer, the whip, or a Mike Johnson, who's a popular member. But my guess is none of them would want to walk into this type of situation. And, and there is precedence, which we've now just recently learned, that the Speaker Pro Tem, who actually I had an IOP member as my Speaker Pro Tem, Mac, Mac Thornberry. I don't know, Mac was, he was here at the IOP for a, a semester about a year ago. When you're Speaker, you choose, you designate who is your successor is going to be. It's a very private thing. You, yeah. you put a name on a piece of paper and it's, it's held in an archive. And then when you're gone, that person becomes the Speaker Pro Tem. In this case, it's Patrick McHenry, Chairman of the Financial Services Committee. He was my deputy whip, an institutionalist, really knows how to run the place. Um, I think Democrats think of him as an honorable person who keeps his word. So he's sort of a gray beard, even though he's a pretty young guy. Uh, there is precedence to have that person be empowered to have speaker-like powers for legislative purposes, but not in the line of succession. So I think the break the glass last resort is to give McHenry hmm. the ability to be a speaker for legislative reasons, be able to schedule legislation, bring bills to the floor, run the committee system, um, but he would not be in the line of succession like the speaker is. So he'd anything, everything but that, and he would have that until such time as you can find a speaker or some date certain. And that's probably where they're going to end up if, if Jim Jordan can't put it together. Wow. Well, we'll so have to see. That's a mouthful. <laughs> um, so um, let's go to the economy. And um, I should have mentioned at the outset the way this is going to work is, is you and I are going to talk um, for a bit. I have a bunch of questions for you. Uh, and then we're going to open things up to the floor uh, for people to ask you questions. Sure. So the economy. Um, so the unemployment rate is uh, close to a 50-year yeah. low. Labor force participation is at its, uh, at least for prime age individuals, it's something, it's like close to its high for this century. Um, inflation is not as low as it was a few years ago, but it actually is lower than it was when Ronald Reagan ran for re-election in 1984. Um, and yet, um, when people are polled about how they feel about the US economy, uh, the results are nothing like this kind of feeling that there was mourning in America 
uh, you know, sure. uh, you know, Ronald Reagan's uh, campaign slogan. So, so curious about kind of your take on this. Uh, you know, what's going on? What you think is right and wrong about the U.S. economy? Well, uh, first, forecasters were wrong that we would be in a recession now. So a year ago, forecasters, I think, I mean, what NBER is just on the street, right? It is right so, down the street. Um, that's the inflation measurers. Um, we thought we were going to be in a recession this quarter or next quarter. My, my, my guess is most forecasters are probably right, which is we just delayed it. We didn't, uh, uh, we didn't dodge the recession. We delayed the recession or a severe slowdown probably late next year, meaning Q3, Q4, 2024, right around the time for the election, to, to your point about yeah. morning in America. Yeah. Um, headline inflation is, is still pretty, pretty ugly. Um, and people are still feeling the pinch of it. So voters are clearly seeing inflation, feeling inflation. Core inflation, which strips out food and energy, uh, you know, that's, that's $100 oil is, is, is really affecting voters. So I think people feel worse. They think the country's on the wrong track. Two-thirds of the people feel that way. You have s fairly slow growth now, going to get slower, maybe even a recession, and our purchasing power is being eroded. And I don't think you see an end in sight. I think you tell me, oh. you're, you and your husband are better. You could run circles around me on the economics, but, but I can't imagine Jay Powell is going gonna, is gonna to get us to 2% inflation in 2024. If he tries, he's going to crush banks, put us into a recession. So I think he's going to glide us there. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be three-something inflation rate, which is too high above the mandate. So I don't think we're going we're gonna to have stories saying we've slayed the inflation dragon before the election. We're going to still have inflation, and the Fed is going to glide us into 2%, probably, I don't know, 2025? You tell me um, what you think it is. I, well, but I think their, their own projections call for, you know, for it to take a few years. It's going to take a long yeah. time. It's yeah. going to take a long time. Yeah. And, and to do otherwise would be to, I mean, there are so many regional banks that, are, that have so many unrealized losses on their books yeah. that you could really mess up the banking system, uh, which would be a, a, a disaster and put us into a recession. So I just don't think, the Fed is always going to say 2%. It's just how fast does it take to get there? It's going to take a long time. Yeah. So I don't think we're going to have a good economy for a while. Um, having said that, having 3.7% inflation, I mean, um, unemployment's great. That's good. That means the Fed can keep going. So I think the Fed will probably have another, maybe another rate, rate increase, and they're going to hang on for a long time, I think. This consensus that they're going to, this idea that they're going to start cutting rates in at six months, I don't buy that. I just don't see them doing that, especially if they have unemployment where it is. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what about the role for economic policy? Do you think, yeah. you know, given where we are now, uh, you know, there are some lessons that we should have learned about the fiscal and monetary policy that we have deployed over the last few years? Yeah. My biggest worry is our debt and our interest rates and our debt servicing costs. Uh, we need to have nominal GDP outpace you know, our interest rates, mm -hmm. and it's not. And I don't know if it's going to be anytime soon. And, and, and right now, if you look at all the, the bond markets, we're throwing, I think it's $337 billion a week of bills, notes, and bonds of debt we're floating out there, which is an enormous amount of debt. We have a lot of debt that is coming due that's being turned over. So we, we, we monitor, we, Put, put so much debt out there when interest rates were so low, that is all coming due. We're refinancing this debt at much higher interest rates and locking in a pretty ugly trajectory. There is a bit of crowding out in the bond markets right now. And people, I mean, the four year went from 0.33 in April of 2020 yield to 488 last week. Yeah. So the 10 year is, 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 is really yeah. kind of alarming to me. What that tells me is dodging a debt crisis, we always thought was something we had to worry about a decade or two out. It doesn't look like it's that far out in my mind. And it's probably not until the markets know the Fed is going to top off. Then I think things can calm down. But until we don't know when the Fed is going to top off, we're going to have some really problems in our bond markets. So we're crowding out other debt. Capital is becoming more expensive. It is definitely going to be a credit crunch that is going to come and slow down our economy. And I'm just worried about our ability to manage this, this mountain of debt. And the, the real problem is, in my mind's eye, you have terrible politics right now. We have unserious politics that is incapable of dealing with the drivers of our debt, which is basically our entitlement programs, going bankrupt. And there is not a serious political effort to address that. 
That's my biggest concern. Yeah, yeah. So I, I know kind of worrying about um, debt has been, you know, something that kind of you're, you're, you're known for. And, uh, and, you know, I sh and I share This is how you came close with your husband. So <laughs> her, Karen's husband, Doug Elmendorf. You guys know who Doug Elmendorf is? Come on. Everybody knows who Doug Elmendorf is, right? Yeah, so so there he, he's been in the front row right here. No, I'm just kidding. So, Doug was CBO director uh, when I was chair of the budget committee. So we worked uh, uh, very closely together. Um, and he was a Democrat and I was a Republican. You were a Democrat appointee. And we worked very, very well together. Uh, you were, he was a fantastic CBO director. But we ran all these numbers back in those days. And in those days, we were worried our debt was getting too big. And it was about half of what it is today. Oh, I know. So it's, it's, it's gotten really ugly fast. That's right. I, I was just checking the numbers before I came over here that uh, I, I think when you were speaker, uh, we expected debt to GDP to be something like 85% That's right. That's right. Uh, by now. And now, of course, we're, we're around oh, 100%. 103%. And, uh, you know, speaking of Doug and CBO, <clears throat> CBO is projecting that debt um, over the next 30 years will rise to 180%. And that's of based GDP. on a baseline that is 100, 100 um, basis points lower on interest rates than we have right, right now. Right, right. And Im importantly, in this point you were making, it's based on current policy. Current, yeah, right. Which current policy, <laughs> yeah. The way the CBO, these, these ugly, Horrific CBO projections are based on debt that assumes we're going to have a bunch of tax increases and, and spending cuts coming, and it assumes our interest rates are about a point lower than they are right now. And um, I don't think any of us, I don't know what the alternative fiscal scenario looks like right now. I haven't looked at it lately, but it's, it's, going, to, it's going to look worse. <laughs> and that's probably more close to reality. We, we're getting gobbledygook here. The CBO basically says, here's what current law says. It's a total catastrophe of debt. And then they put in assumptions, but here's probably what the politicians will do, and it's even worse than that. It's yeah. basically what that looks like. Yeah. Well, so you mentioned um, entitlement reform. You were talking about Social Security and Medicare. So I just, uh, you know, how optimistic are you? Do you see any appetite, even in the Republican Party, I know. Uh, for any significant change we, we in entitlement programs? Yeah, and I think the real reason we backslid is we have this populist running our party right now who's against doing anything, you know, important and that's principled, in my opinion. So he's not for doing any of, of, of the tough stuff of fixing entitlements because he doesn't think they're popular. And that, to me, is the opposite of leadership. But when, when, when Doug was CBO director and I was budget chair, we passed four budgets in the House that reformed our entitlement programs balanced the budget and paid off our debt. It took about 30 years to do it, but paid off our debt. It reformed the way Medicare works, reformed the way Medicaid works. We put separate bills on Social Security because that can't, you can't use this thing called reconciliation for that. But we voted on raising the retirement age. We voted on means testing the benefits. We voted on converting Medicare to a premium support system like the Federal Employee Health Benefit Plan. We voted on all these tough things to to get the debt under control, and I would argue nobody lost their congressional seat or their Senate seat over doing that. You know, Patrick's dad, Pat Toomey, and I voted for all these things, um, and we got reelected fine yeah. from, from Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. So <clears throat> none of this. A, can, can I ask you about this? So, I mean, <clears throat> I think politicians today would say, well, well, I won't support that because my constituents don't want me to support that. But you, do you think there's a, a role for, um, uh, elected officials, you know, to educate. Yeah, to yes. to, uh, to educate. And do you think that's <clears throat> that's part of the problem, you know, with, with what's going on now? In the in the mid two thousands, we did that. We passed, as I mentioned, four four different no, from twenty ten to twenty eighteen. Every session we passed a budget. That's eight budgets we passed. Um, doing what I just described, getting the debt under control, reforming entitlement programs, and a budget resolution calling for all these reforms. And members of Congress fled, went out to their congressional districts and did town hall meeting after town hall meeting. I used to do town hall meetings with members of Congress to show them how to talk about this stuff in their districts, in their editorial boards, about the need to prevent Social Security's insolvency, the need to prevent Medicare from going bankrupt, and the kinds of reforms that are necessary to do that, which also averted a debt crisis. And we voted for those things and survived our elections. So my point is, these things aren't third rail politics. If you lean into these issues and, and treat people with respect of telling them the truth. But that is not where our unserious populist politics are today. And that is, in my opinion, a big problem. So I don't see Congress anytime soon 
doing what is necessary to avert a debt crisis. The only alternative I think today you have is possibly a commission. Well, so I was going to ask you about that. Yeah. You, you served on uh, Bull Simpson in 2010, yep. uh, so you have experience doing this. I mean, it, it is interesting because I think economists, we tend to write these papers where we're kind of laying out some set of policy levers that you could switch yeah. on or off, and that's how you would resolve things. Uh, but in truth, it's not really... The problem isn't, it's not really a technical problem, right? I mean, you said this yourself, you designed yeah. budgets, right? It's about making decisions that uh, involve hard trade-offs. Yeah, the, the, the good news is we can fix this problem. Yeah. We know what levers we need to pull. Yeah. We know, and I would argue center left and center right could come together to do this. I really believe that that's the case. The, the, that's the good news. The bad news is we just don't have politics that can get us there right now. Yeah. Um, the, the, the big flaw with the Bull Simpson Commission was it wasn't a statutory commission. So Can you explain what, yeah, what so, that means? So it was a commission um, created by an executive order during a debt limit deal. And literally in the last meeting, it was over in the Senate Budget Committee, uh, the last meeting of the commission um, where we're all saying, hey, nice to work with you these last six months, you know, enjoyed meeting you, blah, blah, blah. Pelosi, the speaker then, Obama, the president then, put out a statement saying, we're not doing it. <laughs> it, was, it was literally dead before we left the room. And that means, what I mean statutory commission is, it was the politicians could just choose whether they wanted to look at it, vote on it or not. A statutory commission, on the other hand, like the Greenspan Commission in the early 80s for Social Security, requires Congress to vote on it. Up or down, no amendment, no filibuster, they don't have a choice. Like the base clothing, so closing commissions. Down. So they have to take responsibility. Yeah, so you have for, to. And the leading bill is Mitt Romney's, Mitt Romney's bill with yeah. Mike Bennett, a Republican Democrat, Mike Gallagher, a Wisconsin guy, and um, Ed Case, a Hawaii Democrat. So you got Republican Democrat sponsors of a commission bill right now that's statutory that says hmm. go figure out how to solve these problems, get the debt under control, bring solvency to these entitlement programs and bring it back to Congress, and Congress has to vote on it, up or down. And if you have a president that says, I'll sign it if you put it on my desk, then you have a much better chance at law, because politicians will not risk their seats if they don't think there's a shot at this becoming law. Yeah. Like, why am I going to take that? They're just self-serving. Why will I take this vote if it's going nowhere and I'm going to kill myself in the process? But if this thing really solves the country's problem, really dodges a debt crisis, and it has a decent chance of going to law, I'll put my neck on the line and vote for it. That's the best chance you have. Um, I published a book last November at, at, at my think tank, the American Enterprise Institute, um, where we laid out how we think it ought to be done. So if a commission was to put a plan on the, on the table for exactly how to dodge a debt crisis, we put a book out that shows that. Now, we're conservatives, and we showed how we would do it. But I would argue you could walk... 20 yards down the street to the Brookings Institution yes, where you right. and Doug worked. You worked with Alice Rivlin. And, and right? Alice Rivlin and I actually put yeah. together a deal um, on Medicare and Medicaid that, that then Ron Wyden and I carried, a, a Democrat, where we agreed on how to fix the problems. So I do believe that center left and center right, Brookings and AEI, Paul Ryan and Alice Rivlin, we, we, we know what to do and kind of how to do it. And we can, there's enough there that you can come together and solve this. Again, unserious politics, but if you could get maybe a statutory commission, that's probably the best shot you've well, got. So, so one of the things that was so great about Alice was she was such an optimist, yeah. which I think you are as well. You're an optimist. But are you optimistic that, that we will get um, a commission in place, set up, kind of into the law without it, some sort of crisis occurring? Is there a path uh, It to would be there? in a brinksmanship moment where my price of voting for this debt limit increase or this, this, this must-pass piece of legislation is this commission. I think that's, I think that's in the cards. Uh, people were advancing this just recently with the speaker election with Kevin. Um, the Senate has been agitating for this. So when you're, when you're running Congress and you're passing must-pass legislation, this is the kind of conversations Jim Jordan's having tonight with, <laughs> with 20 people. Um, what do you need to, to support, to get to vote for this? More and more these days, members are saying, who are really worried about the debt, I, I want a debt commission to deal with this. So that is becoming more of the sort of the, the ask from a lot of people. So I think it's, it's got a decent chance and possibility. Okay. 
I, I, I want to be optimistic as well. Yeah, I hope um, so. We uh, kind of we advertise this as a talk about uh, tax policy. So let's talk about tax policy. Let's let's start with the 2017 tax cuts. Um, the lion's share of them expire in 2025. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so what do you think should happen then? Should we let them expire? Well, should we do something else? Not all of our problems can be solved with economic growth, but you can't really solve any of our problems unless you have economic growth. And I think it would be a, uh, it would be a very ugly shock to growth. And I've seen studies to the contrary. I, just, I, I think there are studies that back this up. You would, you would shock growth if you let those expire. And what I mean when I say those expire, the main, so I, was, is for, I wrote this law, so this was the, the 2017 tax law. Um, we worked on this law for, I wanna say six years at the Ways and Means Committee. There are a couple things that we had to do for America's competitiveness that are permanent. Number one, we had to switch from a worldwide tax system to a territorial tax system because American companies were quickly moving overseas and changing their headquarters to overseas, redomiciling for tax reasons. That ended and that stopped and we kept those companies, those jobs in America. That was very, very good policy. We had to lower our corporate tax rate, which is not a big revenue raiser for our federal government, to a, a level where it's internationally competitive with the rest of the world for the same reason, international competitiveness. The day we passed that bill, Tim Cook from Apple called me and said, because of this bill being passed now, I'm bringing 20,000 jobs to America and I'm repatriating billions of dollars into this, this country. And I'm gonna build a whole new headquarters in Austin, Texas. Things like that happen as a result of passing that tax bill. What's expiring is the fact that when we drop the rate on corporations, we also drop the rate on small businesses. We call them pass-throughs. They're, they're people who file their taxes, who own businesses as individuals. And we drop that rate at the same um, pace, effectively, as, as the corporate rate. That rate goes back up. So we tax corporations at 21% today in America, and, and small businesses, which, which are most of businesses in America, um, got a corresponding drop in their rates. That goes away, and their top tax rate will go to 44.6% in 2025, if that is allowed to happen. And that will do great damage to those small businesses. More importantly, which is where most people get their jobs, but it also puts them at a huge competitive disadvantage against corporations. So I think, I think whoever's in Congress is gonna keep that. I think they'd be foolish not to. The other big piece of policy is expensing, and I don't wanna to get too deep in the details, but my guess is your friends at NBER would say, full expensing is a good thing. It's, it's good for economics, it's good for productivity, wage growth, standard of living, jobs, and I think we will keep that. Versus going back to these complicated depreciation schedules where businesses take years to write off the investments in their businesses. That's not politically very controversial, but right there I just spent, you know, I don't know, $500 billion in those three sentences. So it's probably a little less than that. Um, and then the salt deduction, which I know in this state people are pretty salty. Um, we, we repealed- Salt stands for- State and local tax deduction. Yep. Um, we repealed for the most up to $10,000 um, an exemption. Your ability to write off your, your tax the cost of your tax, your state local taxes off your federal taxes. We didn't think it was fair. We got rid of it. It helped pay for these reforms. And that's in, in the air right now. So there's going to be churn in the tax code, but I would, not, um, I would not get rid of those provisions. I think it's going to be hurtful for growth. The book I mentioned at AEI, we're actually proposing a, a, a tax reform 2.0 which would, I would switch our, our, our business tax to a destination-based cash flow tax. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's a mouthful. I won't <laughs> yeah. explain what all that does. I think there's a better way of taxing businesses in America that's, that has less loopholes, less picking winners and losers in Washington, better for the economy, and I would throw a carbon tax on top of it because I think that's far, far smarter to go after carbon through price signals in the tax code than the policies we have today. Mm -hmm. So I actually agree with decarbonizing. I think it's a good policy for our country, but there's a more free market way of doing it where you're not damaging economic growth or subsidizing yesterday's technology, which is, I would argue, the current policy. And that gets you a tax code that can replace the revenues we have today and then some. I think that's a better policy going forward. Um, and if you can't sleep at night, go to our book, American Renewal at AEI.org, and you can read about how we propose to do this. Okay. If you, ca if you, if you can't sleep because you're worried about it's a the tax system, or you yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, no. the other thing. Yeah. 
Um, okay, yeah, let's we'll see. Uh, just on that growth question, you're worried about, we're all worried about growth, and it will make our uh, debt problems worse, worse if we are not growing as fast. Um, do you think we have evidence that, the, that when the tax cuts were uh, passed in 2017, that growth picked up? I mean, I know this is a hard thing no, we to, do. To, um, to quantify. Well, remember, COVID hit us, and that yeah. threw us through a loop. Yeah. But I'm not going to stand behind the, the CEA. They put out some weird numbers at the time, um, the Council for Economic Advisors. But CBO and joint tax were on the money. And, and the Congressional Budget Office and the Joint Committee on Taxation, Congress's revenue estimators, were correct in predicting faster economic growth. We banked on that. Um, it did give us better wage growth, better job growth, better productivity growth, therefore higher living standards. The bottom two quintile income earners, the lowest income earners, got the fastest wage growth after this. Um, but you know, our sample got a little messed up because COVID hit, and so that threw everybody's numbers through, through a loop. But we were seeing better economic growth, but more importantly, what we were trying to achieve was, yes, better economic growth, but you have to remember the point in time we were in. We were looking at American companies becoming extremely uncompetitive and leaving America. We had hedge funds coming to us telling us that they were going to buy all the pharmaceutical companies and re-domicile them in, Amer in Ireland and become Irish companies and pull these companies out of New Jersey, out of Chicago, out of America because of our tax laws. I'm a Miller drinker because I'm from Wisconsin. Miller's a U.S. company, but Budweiser is a... Is, is a is a Belgian company, and we asked the InBev CFO to come to Congress and tell us, why is Budweiser a Belgian company and not a St. Louis company? They're like, easy, it's 24% tax rate versus a 35% tax rate, that's why. This was happening across the board. We stopped that hemorrhaging of US businesses and jobs from going overseas, and because of the, we got ourselves in sync with the rest of the world, we brought a lot of capital that was stuck overseas back into the country. So by any measurement, that was successful and good for economic growth. There are three things I think we need to do to get the economy growing. Fix our immigration laws to, mm -hmm. to deal with labor supply issues that are coming with the boomers. Get a good tax system that is pro-growth and gets us the revenues we need and get our entitlements under control and dodge a debt crisis. We dodge a debt crisis by getting our entitlements under control. We keep strong productivity and economic growth with a good tax system and we address our labor supply problems, and we're gonna have a heck of a great century. His old agency is telling us, for the next 30 years, this economy is scheduled to grow at 1.3%. That is half the rate we grew for the last 30 years. So all of you students here, what, what our best forecasters are telling us is the economic growth for your generation is gonna be half the rate it was for mine. That's ridiculous. That means much slower standard of living growth lower upward mobility. The American dream is, is slower than it was for my generation. And we've never done that in this country. We've always made it better off for the next generation. That's the whole legacy of the idea of this country. And the primary reason the Congressional Budget Office tells us this is labor. Right. We're going from 40 million boomers to 77 million retirees. Slowly. Yeah. And we have lower birth rates and fewer people following them into the workforce. We can top this off. Yes, let's have more kids. But we can top this off with legal immigration. Legal. And so we can get back to that faster growth rate if we have good labor policies, what, good what immigration would you do with policies. Immigration? How much time do you have? <laughs> well, so, I do, I, I do want to Secure the border, that, fix the yeah. asylum laws, but fix our broken immigration system. I, I broke my pick on this issue three times, trying to get a deal on immigration. But if we can have a, a, a guest worker program, get, fix the DACA kids problem. And, and get a good working legal immigration problem where working age people are coming in to, to bring their contributions, not taking people's jobs, not depressing wages, but filling massive labor vacancies we have in this economy, that means faster growth, more jobs, higher living standards for everybody. And if we do that, and we're a blessed continent, if we do that and get our border secure and everything, we can have faster economic growth and Doug's old college at the Congressional Budget Office will change their assumptions and say to you in this generation, you know what? We have a better shot at growing at 3% like we used to. We're going to have a great takeoff in this economy because we got our act together. It's still not too late to do it. But again, back to my original point, our politics are pretty unserious at this point right now.
I think this might be the... Sorry for getting off on a rant there. I think this forum event uh, might be the foreign forum event where we uh, mentioned CBO uh, the, yeah. the, the most times. Uh, nice advertisement for an organization which I am a huge fan of. Um, let's um, go to um, poverty and economic mobility. I mean, I think you're already kind of, yeah. you know, touching on some of these issues. So I, I know you care deeply. Uh, and I know you're involved uh, with a center at uh, Notre Dame Notre yep. that's thinking about this. So can, can you talk a little bit about um, your efforts in that regard and what changes you think we need to have in society and economic policy to address the challenge, the, you know. Yeah, I'm actually really high, excited about this. Poverty too high. I'm really excited because yeah. I think we can really turn the corner in many major ways. Uh, so I teach, I'm an adjunct economics professor at Notre Dame, and I teach in their Laboratory for Economic Opportunity, which is a, a lab, kind of like what Raj Chetty does at Opportunity Insights here, um, very similar. And, and I have a foundation I run out of Wisconsin um, called the American Idea Foundation, focused on, on poverty economics. And so it's most of my vocation these days, my vocational careers in the poverty space. Long story short, I believe the field of economics can make a huge positive contribution to bending the curve on poverty and going with what we call evidence-based policy making. The last law I wrote uh, when I was speaker with a friend of mine, Patty Murray, a, a progressive Democrat sure. from Washington State, sure. was this law called the Evidence Act. It's actually yep. an idea I got from Harvard from Raj Chetty. Yep. You guys know who Raj Chetty is? He's a professor here. He had this awesome study on upper mobility in America and I read it, was enamored with it. I asked him to fly down to DC and walk me through it. He walked me through, on a census track by census track basis, you know, the upper mobility rates of Americans and the, the pattern recognition that comes from that. It was really interesting stuff. And he proceeded to tell me how he sort of like got, talked his way into this data at, at, at the IRS and just sort of by happenstance got this data. I went to Notre Dame, spoke the next week. This was in Congress. I was just there for a football game with my family. And I told them the story, and like, well, wouldn't it be great if the rest of us could get access to this data? Think of all the interesting work we could do if we could get this data from the federal government on poverty policy and programs. You guys ought to do a commission to do this. So I did that. So I formed a commission. A guy named Ron Haskins from Brookings ran it. Yeah. And they told us this is how the federal government can disseminate all of its data on its programs so that researchers on a privacy compliant basis can tease out whether things work or don't. And so my long story short to your answer to your question is, we have, we're, in, we're, we're almost 60 years into the war on poverty. We spent upwards of 15 to, trillion, 15 to 20 trillion dollars on this. And we've, we really have, we've moved material poverty in a long way, but we really haven't fixed the problem. And I would argue for policymakers, we measured the war on poverty based on effort and input. How much money are we spending? How many programs are we creating? And we really haven't measured uh, based on outcome and results. Are we truly getting people out of poverty? Have we reignited upper mobility in America? And the answer is no. And so what we can now do with data and econometrics and economics, randomized control trials, is see what works and what doesn't work, measure programs to, to measure their effectiveness and that can inform us as to take money from these programs that don't work and put money in programs that do work. Go with what works, and we like to call this evidence-based policymaking. The reason I got so enamored with this is when I was trying to pass poverty bills, I got into these massive ideological partisan fights. I, I tried reforming the disability program by letting people go work side jobs and, and keep you know, some of their money and lose um, three dollars for every three dollars they earn, they'd lose one in benefits, and it was everybody. And it was a win-win. They could they could benefit if from the, if they didn't want to if they wanted to, and it was like the end of the world was coming. It was uh, the protests and all the the gnashing of teeth and the and the the violent opposition to reforming any of these pro poverty programs got me to take a step back and think, how do we get into the business of solving poverty problems without getting into these horrendous gridlocking partisan stalemates. And I think evidence and facts work. So now we have new tools that we use to measure the effectiveness of our poverty <clears throat> programs. 
Let's follow them where they go, and let's put money where we know it works now that we measure these things. And that is why I'm actually fairly enamored um, with, with this new evidence-based policymaking approach. And I really do think we can have more opportunity insights, more LEOs, more academic institutions like Harvard and Notre Dame, finding out what works, informing policymakers, leapfrogging ideological stalemates, and actually going with what works. So I'm actually pretty bullish and optimistic yeah. that we can really start, start turning the corner on this. I, th I think you're, you're, you're <clears throat> preaching to the choir here because this is one of the kind of fundamental things we teach here at the Kennedy School, the importance of evidence-based policymaking. And you're um, both getting across the point that it is kind of technically the right thing to do, but we also kind of teach our students that it has to be politically feasible. That's right. But I think, I think the other point that this is something that will kind of help the politics along is a really important point as well. Yeah, I, I think the big fight's gonna be on how benefits are designed. And, 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 and we should go with what has the best evidence of actually getting people up and out of poverty, not keeping them in poverty. And I think we're starting to amass a lot of good data on that. And I think that can inform policymakers to make good choices and good decisions without getting stuck in these ideological battles. Yeah. Um, OK, I think uh, we're at the point where we're going to um, kind of switch over to uh, kind of audience questions. So the way this is going to work is we have four microphones. We've got one there, one up there, one up there, one up there. Uh, and I'd like you to line up. I'm going to kind of just go from microphone to microphone. Uh, please state your name. Uh, please um, state your question. And two things about the question. One, uh, kind of make sure it ends with a question mark. <laughs> uh, we don't want statements. We want questions. But also just keep it brief so that we can get in as many questions as possible. <clears throat> so with that, I'm going to start over here at this microphone. Um, hi. I just want to say thank you so much for coming to talk to us. Uh, my name is Nigel. I'm a first year at the college. Um, and my question was just, it seemed like in starting in like 2017 with the last administration, there was a shift in Washington on trade policy. Yeah. Um, and I wanted to hear like, what are your views on yeah. trade um, and with, you know, the recent legislation, whether it be the IRA or the CHIPS Act, and how does that affect like inflation long term? Uh, it's inflationary. <laughs> Current trade policy, no two ways about it. Actually, Obama and I agree on trade and Biden and Trump disagree with us and agree with each other on trade in a weird, weird way. Um, I actually wrote the law called Trade Promotion Authority so Barack Obama could go negotiate the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which I am very much in favor of. Um, the problem we had was when we got that thing negotiated, and the Obama, they did a good job on that. Um, a guy named Mike Froman negotiated it. Um, both Clinton and Trump came out against it. And so both of our parties and our leading people in our parties are against trade. It's a disaster for us. It's bad for our foreign policy. It's bad for economic policy. It is inflationary. But frankly, I don't see an end in sight right now. Um, uh, IRA, I'm not a fan of, to my point. I think you're better off with the carbon tax than all these, these subsidies um, running through Washington of today and yesterday's technologies. It is inflationary. Um, I, the only exception for industrial policy in my mind's eye is for national security. And I think the CHIPS Act did rise to that level of, of, of national security exception for an industrial policy. So I actually am in favor of that. I'll try and keep it quick. Great. So Thanks, Daniel. Uh, we're going to go to there. Hi, my name is Jason. I'm MCMPA. I oh. wanted to ask just like more of a personal question. I was thinking, which one do you enjoy more? Did you enjoy being Speaker of the House more, or do you enjoy your life now? You're on the Fox. Oh, Board this one's way easier. I like my life now. Are you kidding me? And then, and then which one my favorite job was Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, which was my dream, which is what I wanted to do. Um, speaker was an honor, a privilege, but not super fun. <laughs> yeah. More influence now. Oh, I lost you there. More influence. Do you think you had more influence before when you were Speaker of the House, or now? Oh, no. Clearly, a Speaker of the House. You, you decide what Congress passes in a law. So it's, it's like the apex of influence. I did it for two terms out of my 10 terms in Congress. Believe it or not, it doesn't sound like it. I'm actually for term limits. I know it didn't look like it. But um, I just don't think you should be a lifer there. Plus, uh, you have my son's a sophomore here. Um, I had three kids in high school at the time. I saw them on Sundays, and I wanted to have like a normal family life before they got out of high school. So my reasons were more personal for, for retiring. Thank you. 
Yep. I, think, I think you were telling me when we spoke um, earlier how much you've enjoyed getting out and interacting with people in the business community. And yeah, very much so. How much you're learning from that. Um, thanks, Jason. We're going to go up there. Hi, I'm Eric Castillo. I'm a senior at Near North that also worked at HKS. So my question for you was, well, so, actually just forgot. Anyway, um, your experience within public service, how do you build that consensus without people trying to block things because of the party you represent? Yeah, it, I think the reason, one of the reasons you have such a impasse right now is because there really isn't a guiding policy or principle right now that people look to as a North Star. We have a political leading populist movement in my party right now. Look, I think it's not a secret that Donald Trump and I don't really get along, right? I mean, so the, the best way to organize a party is to, to have a, a foundation of principles that you share and agree with, and then problem sets that you're applying those principles to to give you policies that you agree on and that you all mutually agree to go after. I organized Congress over an agenda of policies based on our principles to solve the problems that we thought we wanted to solve. And I was able to get people to, to coalesce around that. And that to me is the best way to organize a legislative body. We don't have that right now. We have populism untethered to principle, kind of cult personality populism, if you ask me. And that is, that is not coherent. It is hard to get people to rally around that. And that is why I think you basically have a bit of chaos. And in, in I'm just speaking for my part. I think the Democrats have got their own problems. But that's what's hard right now. It's hard to run Congress when you can't speak to a, a common belief set or a common agenda you're all trying to achieve to get people to rally around. I was able to get people to set aside their personal politics and issue in service of, of an agenda that they, they agreed to in the beginning of this session. None of that's happening right now. It's all populism and personality, and that's one of the reasons why I think they're having a hard time getting everybody to, to, to get on the same page. Thank you. Down here? Hi, my name's Ayush. I'm a grad student. I'm also from Wisconsin. Um, oh, yeah, where? Uh, Muskego. Well, I represent Muskego. Yeah. Very cool. Would you go to Muskego High School? No, I went to USM in okay. Milwaukee. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. uh, yeah, so my question was, uh, so I have, you mentioned a lot about the need for growth, uh, especially in the next uh, upcoming 30, 40 years, and technology being one of those main contributors. We're in an interesting time right now where uh, like the main technology that's booming, artificial intelligence, has dubious implications for the labor supply. So uh, I was just curious as to uh, what you think the role of government regulation would be in that industry to make sure it's best aligned with our need for growth while also ensuring it doesn't negatively impact labor supply. Uh, well, I mean, uh, I, I'm in the Mark Andreessen camp on this one. So I think this is going to be additive to growth. Will it displace jobs? Of course it will. It will, place, it will displace more white collar jobs than blue collar jobs, frankly. But they will create lots of other jobs. This is how economics works. Creative destruction works this way. So I see it as adding to productivity, adding to living standards, helping us. So. The proper role for regulation is a good question. And the secret is, can you have a regulatory regime that protects against the downside cases? You know, you know is it going to kill us all? You know, through you know, teaching terrorists how to get bioweapons and things like that. And, but is, is it, are your regulations flexible enough that it encourages growth and development? And then the question is, let's just say we get the regulations right in America, which that's, that's unclear at this time. What about nation states that don't have um, the society's best interests in mind? China, Russia, North Korea, Iran. So it's really important that we stay in the first mover status. It's really important we win quantum computing. We win the AI um, race so that we can help shape this with our values and that our regulations allow for um, in a, you know, innovation to occur but do it in such a way that protects against these downsides. That's hard to do. And I don't think there's one government agency I can think of off the top of my head that's, yeah, that's the place to regulate it. Like the FTC, that's... Hmm. So I think you're going to have to think outside the box on, on AI with some kind of a self-regulatory organization environment so that you have regulations that can that cannot stifle but can also understand and, and capture the downside risk while encouraging innovation. Again, if we had serious politics, we could, we'd be in the midst of doing this right now we really don't have serious politics. So in exchange, you have Biden basically 
doing the right thing. You have Biden saying to all these tech execs, please voluntarily subscribe to a code of conduct. Please, please, please. And operate that way. And, you know, they're doing it, but that's that's not an, that, that's not going to work for very long, I don't think. So I'm bullish about technology. I'm bullish about AI. I think like other giant explosions in technology, it's going to give us a lot of productivity, higher living standards, new jobs and new industries, um, which, yes, will replace others. But those are going to be those are going to those are going to be good for people. So I think that's that's the pace of things. If we thought this technology is going to be the one that, that that's bad for everybody, we've we've said this for years and years and years, and it's, it's never true. So I'm in the bullish, optimistic phase that this is going to be good for humanity, so long as we make sure that we guard against some of the downside risks. Thank you. Interesting question, Jay. Hi, Speaker Ryan. Thank you very much for being here with us tonight. My name is Jay. I'm an MPP student. Two very brief questions for you. The first more broad, the second technical. The first on tax. What do you think of the Biden administration's proposals for the global corporate minimum tax? And second, you mentioned unrealized uh, losses of uh, regional banks. So I have to ask you about that, obviously. There was a proposal from the Fed in July about including those uh, um, for banks' capital requirements, essentially as a way to raise capital requirements. What do you make of the state of play on banks' capital requirements today? Uh, th so the last one, really good question. I think the Fed's going to be very, very careful so that they give, they give some banks some forbearance to get through this moment. Um, because what I really worry about, just as a guy from Wisconsin, is you don't want to crush these, these community and regional banks. That's what's unique about America, unique about our economy. It's how jobs get fueled and funded. And we don't want to have like seven SIFI banks and that's it. SIFI banks are the, the really big banks that are mm. protected by Dodd-Frank. So I think in this moment, because of the way the yield curve's working, the Fed needs to give some forbearance to let them work this off. That's, that's the key. As far as the specifics of it, I can't comment on that. Um, I'm not a fan of the global min tax. I think it's the wrong way to go. I think Janet Yellen going around the world telling our, our you know, Europeans that we're going to do it is wrong. We're not. And it basically, it, it violates sovereignty in many ways. We're basically going to allow foreign taxing jurisdictions to tax U.S. companies on money outside of their jurisdiction. That's ridiculous in my mind. Um, I go back to the proposal, but, but I'm not just criticizing. I'm putting up an alternative. I think a destination-based cash flow tax, far better, far smarter. It gets you basically that, that, that enforcing global tax. And if we're going to have a min tax, let's do it on carbon. Let's do a border adjustable carbon tax. That way, we are taxing the Indian carbon, the Chinese carbon. And we're America. We start that. We roll it through the rest of the world. That's a smarter way. If you want to get a min tax, do it that way. Plus, it's a twofer. You'll, you'll help incentivize decarbonization. So I think that's just a better way to go. Excellent. Yeah. Up there. Hi, thank you so much for speaking to us. My name's Emily. I'm a medical student and a student at the public health school. And at the public health school, we learn a lot about evidence-based practices that can that involve many of the entitlements that you've talked about cutting. And we learn that there's a lot of evidence that investment in them now can cause huge economic payoff later. And so I was wondering how you reconcile a lot of the work that's been done to cut those entitlements, even though we know that they can have great economic payoff that's a great, later. It's a great question. So long story short, we had this thing that we refer to as a social contract, um, health security, retirement security, and, and a safety net for the poor. I would like to think and argue that we all more or less agree on having that. So I think from a center right and a center left standpoint, we agree we want the social contract. The fights of the 20th century have been resolved. We want it. We like it. We want the safety net. We want this. So here's the point I would make. I think these programs, which were written in the 20th century, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, they were written in ways that are proving unsustainable in the 21st century. And we've learned a whole lot more about how better to run healthcare programs, welfare programs, safety net programs with what we know today than what we knew then. But these programs are still stuck in these designs of the 20th century. So what I'm suggesting is not abandoning the goal of these programs. I'm suggesting bring new reforms to the way these programs operate so that they can actually fulfill their destination, their, their goal better, and do it without spending as much money. They can do it more affordably 
Um, and in many cases, it's harnessing the power of the private sector, choice and competition. And, and you can still have your cake and eat it too. You can have a social contract, have a social safety net, fulfill the mission, these, these important missions, but do it without triggering a debt crisis in this country. And I think you clearly can do that. One of the best CBO directors we ever had, probably the best, even though I don't want Peter Orzeg to ever hear this, get back to him, is this guy. Because he, he, he put it, he, correct me if I'm wrong, but he built an actuarial model at, at, at CBO, which told us you can actually fulfill the mission of Medicare by going to a premium support system, which is how the Part D benefit works. It's how the federal employees get their health care. And that brings choice and competition, guaranteed benefits to seniors, and just means test it. Make the rich pay more for it. Uh, risk adjust it. So the healthy and the wealthy don't, don't get as much of a subsidy as the poor and the sick do. I think you can keep your values that way. You can bring choice and competition to that key program and dodge insolvency in a debt crisis. So my point is, we know a lot more now than we did in 1965 when we started that program in particular, or 1932 when we started, I think it's 32, Social Security. Let's bring those ideas to the fore, put those in place, fulfill the mission, don't bankrupt the country. That's my point. The problem, what I just said, is really hard politics, like really hard politics. If you propose any change of these things, a political opportunist will say, you're hurting these programs, you're cutting these programs, you're destroying these programs, vote against the guy. And that's what's prevented us from doing that. That's the challenge we have right now. Sorry, you got me going. It's kind of scratched my itch there. <laughs> We're going to go up there. Great. Hi, uh, thank you so much again for speaking with us today. I'm, I'm Alex. Uh, I'm a senior at the college. And I wanted to ask about your opinion, uh, your um, thoughts on the future of the ACA uh, and uh, what you think is the future of public private uh, cooperation uh, in American healthcare. Good question. I think we should get on to talk about what the future is now. That, whether, I mean, look, I tried to replace it. I didn't. I, it failed by one vote in the Senate. You know, we tried. We didn't get it. I think. I think two things. I like the tax credit model. I think I actually, Tom, a guy named Tom Colbert and I proposed the alternative to the ACA during that debate. Uh, I think the biggest giveaway in the tax system that makes no sense to me is the tax exclusion on, on employer-provided health care. The, the wealthier you are, the bigger the subsidy you get from the taxpayer for health care. It's sort of like upside down. It makes no sense. And it's a big driver of health inflation. So I would take that exclusion away. And, and, and use it for tax credits, like the ACA, but I would change the way the ACA works by, without getting too deep into it, allowing insurance to be insurance. Right now, because of the, we call it tight banning on community rating and the, the way um, the regulations work, it, it's sort of one size fits all insurance. Let different kinds of insurance products be brought to the marketplace so they can be more competitive and stop um, young, poor people subsidizing older, wealthy people, and that's kind of what that's doing. So I would have more flexibility in the way healthcare is regulated, not total, you know, it's called banding. I would just loosen it up a bit so that people can afford health insurance. I wrote the law called Health Savings Account. It was an amendment I passed in a, in a bill in, o, in 03. I think go to higher deductible plans with a tax credit buying those plans with health savings accounts underneath, getting the consumer in the game, to try and bring some cost consciousness into healthcare through the power of consumers, get rid of the tax exclusion, loosen up regulations and health insurance, make it more competitive, and that's what I would do. So I, I just gave you, in one, <laughs> 10 sentences, the easiest way in my mind's eye to clean that up, but it, it's a good mission. It helps get at the uninsured. It's just really expensive, needlessly so, and I think the cross-subsidization basically is from the young to the, to the, to the old, and from the poor to the wealthy is how that works. And it's kind of upside down in my opinion. Let's take uh, one more from the floor. Okay. Um, you have repeatedly talked about how politics of the last 10 years has become unserious and populist. Um, you obviously are one of the most significant politicians of the last 10 years. Yeah, in morning. hindsight, what could or should. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In hindsight, yeah. what could or I've should. I've been gone since 2019. Um, you know, what, in hindsight, what could or should politicians have done to uh, combat that sort of uh, um, shift towards unserious politics? And what can or should politicians do now? That's a darn good question. I mean, I think the rise of digitization has really made politics hard. Um, I wish Mitt and I would have won in 2012. Okay. I wish mm -hmm. that happened. It didn't happen. Um, 
But when I, I came to Congress in 98, before the internet was like a thing, like email was like an internal thing inside of your office. I mean, it was, and so what I watched happen over my career from 98 to 2019, the internet happened. And we all as citizens now consume our information in our algorithmically you know, driven cul-de-sac. We get our reinforcement you know, of our biases to ourselves and that's changed political incentives. So in the old days, like 10 years ago, <laughs> if you wanted to do well in politics, you actually had to be a good legislator. You actually had to pass laws, you know, prove you can do things. And the measurement of success was sort of, you know, persuasion and policy. Could you come up with good ideas? I just gave him my answer for Obamacare. Could you come up with good ideas and then persuade your constituents, your colleagues, your country, this is the way to go, I'm passing it. I'm going to write a law and it's going to make a positive difference in people's lives. I'm proud of the fact that HSAs exist. I think, I think it made a positive difference. Today, that's not really the, the, the coin of the realm in politics as much. We have an entertainment wing of, of our political parties. There's an entertainment wing of the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. And that is your, your value is measured in hits and clicks. You're there to entertain and curate a brand. And you're there to play to your... So let's just say this is American politics right now. That's my crowd. This aisle, these are my folks. They're on my stream. They're on my websites. They're on my social media. They get their information from the same people I get mine from. And I'm talking to them, and that's my stock and trade. I'm going to get famous, and then later I'm going to get rich doing it. And then somebody's going to have them and them, and it's dividing all of us. It's hyper-digital polarization. It's sort of like moral relativism on steroids with digitization. And that, to me, is, is giving us a huge problem in our politics where it, it, it's hard for people to come together and compromise because their crowd doesn't want that. And if you're in the House, less the Senate, but more the House, you're worried more about a primary than you are a general election. You know, I'd say maybe 40 seats in uh, the 435 are, are settled between like five points. Like my, my district actually was a pretty even district. I had to get Democrats and independents to vote for me to, 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 to get elected. Most people don't have that. So now you're swinging for the home team to your cul-de-sac, and this has really sort of screwed up our politics. So I don't think there's any one person or one place that did this. I think it's digitization, it's political you know, performance art, and we now have people that have come to do this. Matt Gates and the seven Neilists who took out Kevin McCarthy in a disgraceful way didn't do it for some principle they did it for some self-aggrandizement. They did it for some branding exercise. And that is what is screwing up our politics. In my party, I just want to get past Trump. I mean, that's all I'm asking for, you know. I think, I think we have sort of populism that's untethered to principle, but I think the Democrats got their own set of problems. The question is, can we get past this political problem we're in, this paralysis we have, and back on a sort of a problem-solving politics? That will happen when the demand is there to supply that. And what I mean by that is what, that will happen when voters say, we're sick of this stuff, get stuff done, get compromises, I'm sending somebody who's gonna get stuff done. It's a supply and demand business. Consumers are demanding political performance artists, that's being supplied. When consumers stop demanding that, at least enough of them stop demanding that, then, they will, then the, better, the better form of politician will be supplied. Sorry, it's not a very good answer, but it's the best one I got for you. Um, let me, let, let's end on a, uh, an optimistic, uh, optimistic note. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, you spent most of your career in public policy, and I just, uh, you know, since we're here with all these students who are interested in public policy, I was wondering, uh, you know, what drew you in and what advice you have for people who want to kind of pursue public policy? Yeah, I loved it. it it's so rewarding. Um, there's nothing, there's no better feeling than taking an idea you're passionate about, sharing it with other people, putting it on a piece of paper, and putting it into law, and then seeing it make a positive difference in people's lives. That's extremely, extremely rewarding and fun. Mm -hmm. So I encourage it. You're here at the Kennedy School. Um, the best advice I can give is your generation's got this challenge I just mentioned. And so how can you individually overcome this hyper-polarizing time Root your arguments in reason and fact, not in emotion. A person who doesn't agree with you isn't a bad person, they just don't agree with you. So 
embrace pluralism. Embrace the idea that people think differently, come to different conclusions. That's a good thing, and you can learn from it. You got two ears, you got one mouth, use it in that proportion. And I think if you approach it that way, which is I can learn from somebody who doesn't think like me, who doesn't agree with me, and I'm going to argue and debate with them, but I'm going, to, I'm going to base it in reason and in fact, not in emotion, you're going to be way out of the game. And if you do that, you'll build good friendships. We're friends and we're from different sides of the aisle. We're, you know, we're, that can happen. It happens all the time. And you can, because, because of who you are and where you are, you can help lead the country out of this kind of dark place we're in with our politics and get us back to problem-solving politics. I, I'll just qu quote with, you know, democracy's messy, it's sloppy, but to quote Churchill, um, the democracy is the worst form of government except for all the other forms of government. And to quote Churchill again, Americans can be counted upon to do the right thing, but only after they've exhausted all the other possibilities. <laughs> I, think we're gonna, I think we're gonna get there. I think, I, actually, because I go to these things and I teach at Notre Dame and I see the youth, you're sick of us hating each other. You're sick of politicians getting nothing done hating each other, owning the libs, or whatever you want to call this stuff. Just help us get past that. Your generation gets us past that and um, get us to a better place. So that, that's what gives me hope. So I'm actually pretty confident, pretty optimistic about it all at the end of the day. Well, thank you. This has been just fantastic. I want to thank you for coming. And please, everyone, kind of join me. My pleasure.